you. Right, here's where we got to yesterday. Um, we were showing the uh, we showed that the uh, the obstruction to deforming a f to extending a first order deformation of a sheaf to second order was the cut product or the unader product of the first order deformation with itself. And um, Dennis and Georg sent me some homework, uh, and many pieces of homework actually. But this uh, this is the one I was I was just going to mention, which was. For higher order, is there such an easy description as a cut product of the um, obstruction class? So, maybe, so uh, maybe I leave it as another um, exercise. But the statement is the following: So, if you if you have something defined over a n, so that's spec of uh, c x over x the n plus one. So a flat family over there, uh, and you want to extend it to the next order. Um, the obstruction is this cut product. Here, again, in the same group, it always comes down to the same obstruction space, which only relies on the original sheaf on, on just x. Uh, but the data to form the obstruction comes from En, from the sheaf En. OK. So, so it does have this nice, similar, very similar cut product description. OK, I'll leave that up. Okay, so moving on, I wanted to talk about Kuranishi theory. So um, I'm not going to prove this, I'm just going to state it. Um, and then I'm going to go into a more global version of it called perfect obstruction theories. Um, so if you have a moduli space of stable sheaves, I'm not dealing with semi-stables at the moment. Um, <coughs> then you can describe it, well, any scheme, you can describe it locally inside, um, locally analytically. Uh, or formally inside its Zariski tangent space. And Kuranishi described it um, better, so he described how it's cut out inside its, ex he gave explicit equations for how it's cut out inside its Zariski tangent space uh, by this Kuranishi map. So what we've been doing is working to finite order here. You can work over more general thickenings, more general ideals. I've been doing it over these curvilinear uh, thickenings, these very simple thickenings, but the, the general story is not much harder. And then this does something actually a bit more, it tells you locally analytically what the moduli space looks like, instead of just formally, uh, which is what this would give you. Okay, uh, And so it says there's, a, there's this map, K, for Kuranishi, uh, which is the cut product, it's just E goes to E cup E that we saw before, plus higher order terms, sort of cubic and so forth. Um, so it's a map from the Zariski tangent space. So you're, in a, you're, you're going to see your moduli space as being cut out inside this vector space by um, the zeros of this nonlinear map to uh, the obstruction space. All right. So the zeros uh, give you the moduli space. They include the origin. That's, uh, that corresponds to the point E in the moduli space. And K is entirely nonlinear at the origin. Its derivative vanishes. It really starts with a quadratic term and then higher order. Okay, so you, the tangent space really is the full vector space at the origin. Okay, any questions about that? Is that statement clear? Yes, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Just uh, you said you described the M inside its tangent space, or is it the total uh, tangent bundle? Uh, no, sorry, I, I just locally, a small piece of M, a little analytic neighborhood of the, of, right, so let me say it more precisely. So take your moduli space, take a point in the moduli space, and now I'm describing a little analytic neighborhood of this point via an analytic neighborhood of the origin in this vector space. Okay. Okay, so what you see is the moduli space, its dimension is obviously less equal the dimension of the vector space it sits in. This is a risky tangent space. And it's greater equal, you know, the number of the dimension of the space it sits in minus the number of equations cutting it out. Okay, so this is sort of unknowns, number of unknowns minus number of equations. And uh, then this mysterious comment in grey, you'll understand a bit better in a few slides time. So maybe I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, and then this quantity here, 
So this, uh, the dimensions of these x groups, which are called little x1 minus x2, um, is when that's a constant, for instance, when the higher x's vanish, then it'll be given by a riemann roch formula. So when that's a constant, it's called the virtual or expected dimension of m. So in good situations, there is no x2, there's no obstruction space, and your moduli space is smooth, it looks like it's a risky tangent space analytically, locally analytically. In, in that case, the, the moduli space has this dimension. And in general, you imagine that the moduli space is cut out by this many equations in this many unknowns, so that if, if those equations were transverse, you would expect this to be the dimension of the moduli space. Of course, they're not transverse. This k really is nonlinear at the origin. But um, this is what you, there's good reasons to expect this to be the dimension of the moduli space. It's what you would expect it to be. If you were allowed to perturb k, which you're not, um, then once you made it transverse to the origin in the obstruction space, then you would get a smooth moduli space of this dimension. So that's called the, the virtual dimension. Okay, so we're going to fantasize for a while, and then later we'll come back to actually proving that although this fantasy isn't quite true, it's, it's as near as damn it true. So it's, as it's close enough. Okay, so th this is the kind of thing I fantasize about. Um, <coughs> so we're going to pretend we have a global Kurunishi model. So the whole moduli space is cut out of a smooth ambient space by a section of a vector bundle <coughs> such that you know the dimension of the ambient space so the number of unknowns minus the number of equations is the virtual dimension and you know I haven't really defined I've only given you a, I haven't really defined the virtual dimension yet I've given you an idea of it but, uh, we come back to that okay this is how I want you to think about moduli spaces this is I mean for the for the purposes of the rest of this talk, it's extremely important that you should think that moduli spaces always look like this. So the Kuranishi model is the local version of this. And this is all, so therefore this is always true locally. And it's not quite true globally, but it's very close to being true globally. And it's extremely important to think of moduli spaces like this because that's how the whole philosophy of virtual cycles goes. The philosophy of virtual cycles is that M will have the wrong dimension in general, it'll be singular, because this S won't be transverse to the zero section of E. But you want to do something like what a topologist would do, which would be to perturb S to make it transverse to the zero section of E. And that will give you a new M, which was kind of smaller of the correct dimension. And that would have a fundamental cycle, and that, that's what you're after. That's going to be the virtual fundamental cycle. So we'll do even better than that. Um, because we have more tools in algebraic geometry and we'll get a virtual cycle of the correct dimension and it won't just it won't come from perturbing things it'll actually come it'll actually be a cycle inside of m so it won't move off m as would happen with perturbations it'll be something better um, but yeah it, it's very important to have this picture in mind but is it true is it risky locally um, is it true is it, yes it is yeah we'll come to that Now, what's going to be true globally is more or less that this picture holds to first order about M. It's not going to hold completely. You're not going to be able to construct the entire A or an E, but you will be able to construct the information of A, a first order neighborhood of A around M. Okay, so to first order about M, this information is just sort of packaged in taking the derivative of this picture. Okay, so that's this. So you have the tangent space to A, it contains the tangent space to M as the kernel of the derivative of the section. Okay, so remember the, the zeros of the section describe M and then to, you look to first order and you see whether S, as, as you go in a direction along A, you s to see whether you're still moving along M, you see whether the section is um, still zero. So you, you take its derivative. All right, and in algebraic geometry, the derivative, of course, doesn't make sense. It would involve picking a connection or something. But on the zero section, which is where we are, where, where S is zero on M, 
the derivative does make sense. So maybe that's an exercise. All right. And then the co-kernel of this derivative is what we call the obstruction space. So that was the thing that was sort of like the x2 on the, um, in the previous lecture. Or it's some family version of x2 varying as you move over the moduli space. So this, this is the thing which is involved in the implicit function theorem. The implicit function theorem says everything, you know, the, mod the moduli space looks to sort of linear or Zariski tangent space information like the zeros of ds. And if, if ds is onto, so s is transverse to the zero section, then there's no obstruction space. And that, that, that linear description is completely accurate. The moduli space looks, locally analytically, like it's tangent space. Okay, the linear theory tells you everything. That's when ds is transverse. And when it's not, the implicit, so that's the, maybe the inverse function theorem. The implicit function theorem is when ds is not transverse, there is some co-kernel. And then what it says is, this is a good model of the moduli space, but on top of it, what you have to do is you have to cut out further so this is the linear space, like the x1 on the previous slide. Then you have to cut out further by a nonlinear piece, which takes values in here. Uh, Richard, we have a question in the Q&A. Yeah. Should the x2 be curly? Shouldn't it be only the global section? It's, it's got a pi uh, down below. So it's the relative x2. So it's the x2s down the fibers. Uh, so it is, it is global down the fibres. It's global on, it's x2 on, yeah. There's base change issues, but if you take that sheaf that I've written there and you restrict it to a point of M, that is the global x2 of the previous slide. Okay, so it turns out this is the thing that will globalize, this sequence. This, this fantasy is, is just that, it doesn't really exist, but this sequence will exist. And it's called a perfect obstruction theory. And there's two things to notice about it. I'm going to call the two terms in the middle, E0 and E1, and they're locally free. Okay, so that's, that's an artifact of the, that, that's, that's the remnants, that's all we can sort of remember of the fact that A is smooth, so that's why E0 is locally free. And E is a vector bundle, and that's why e, E1 is locally free. Okay? And so this, this sort of resolution of the tangent and obstruction spaces of M, this is a locally free resolution of them. It's called a perfect obstruction theory. Okay? And we call, so just some notation, we call E0 to E1 the virtual tangent bundle. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. And it's dual, so we use this standard notation that when you dualize a complex, you move the subscripts to the top and make them negative, um, is called the virtual cotangent bundle. Okay, so this isn't precise yet, but th this is the rough idea. This will be the thing which does globalize. This is the infinitesimal part of the fantasy will make global sense, and that's called this perfect obstruction theory. Yeah. So, uh, should we think of the function k in the previous example as a local expression of this section s? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. You know, I've cut down in in that expression. I've kind of cut down a and e, or t a and e, to be minimal at the point e. You remember that you know. At at the point e that we worked on on the previous slide, this d s would be zero. So I've kind of removed some, but up to quasi-isomorphism, it's the previous, yeah, it is the previous slide. But uh, somehow I've taken uh, these two guys to be, a, on the previous slide, I, I would have taken these two guys to be a minimal possible dimension. But it doesn't matter. You can always add on a little, uh, you know, a, a, some kind of smooth direction to A and some extra piece of E, which is cutting out the origin in that extra smooth direction. And it, it just changes this up to quasi, it doesn't change this up to quasi-isomorphism. So yeah, there's some homotopy in, hidden in this that I'm not going into. I don't, I don't think my answer helped there, but anyway. Okay, so in some sense, this is the key slide, or this is the main idea. 
and now we try and make it a bit more precise. Okay, so because it's algebraic geometry, we dualize everything. So uh, instead of taking um, T, T A and E, or e, e lower zero and e, e lower E one, we take their duals. Okay, so this is E upper minus one and E upper zero. Okay. <coughs> And we map them, the correct way to express that resolution is to consider this map to this object here. Okay, so this is, um, I here is the ideal sheaf of M inside A, that should be a curly A. Um, this is the cotangent bundle of A. And if you imagine a nice situation, this is really the co-normal bundle sat inside the cotangent bundle to A. And so it's in nice situations, D here would be a, um, an injection. And this complex would be quasi-isomorphic to its co-kernel, which would be the cotangent bundle of N. And in general, this is a, re a slight replacement for the cotangent bundle of M called the truncated cotangent complex of M, denoted here. Uh, so maybe I can bring that up. Okay, so um, <coughs> in, in good cases where M inside A is um, smooth or cut out by a regular sequence, this D is an injection and this, this object here is really just the cotangent bundle of M, this LM. But in more complicated situations where M has singularities, maybe it's non-reduced, um, maybe, you know, calculate this in a few cases. So take, take spec of the dual numbers inside um, the affine line and you'll see that in those cases this is not an injection. There's a little bit of fluff over here as its kernel um, and that's called the... Um, oh, there's something homology, what's that called? Andre Quillen something or other. Uh, th anyway, the there's minus one cohomology of the cotangent complex is um, is some it it's some intrinsic thing associated to the singularities of M, which tell you something about their singularities. Okay, but this tr truncated cotangent complex is a very natural thing to consider. It's independent. It's very easy to show. It's independent uh, of the choice of embedding. You know, hint if you have two embeddings do the usual thing, just take their product and compare. It's, it's rather easy to prove this. And what it, what it gives you is it gives you, you know, this is the data of <coughs> its two cohomology sheaves and some extension data of how they're glued together. So the cohomology sheaves are the zeroth cohomology sheaf, which is the co-kernel of this map, is just the cotangent, comp cotangent sheaf of M. Okay, so the the co-kernel of this map is always the cotangent sheaf of M by the exact sequence of Kähler differentials. That's in Hartshorn. And the, the minus one th cohomology, so the kernel here, is some kind of, up to dualizing, it's some kind of a, a intrinsic obstruction sheaf. So we've, we've started to see obstruction spaces. You can always make an obstruction space bigger. You could always add pieces onto it, it would still be a perfectly good obstruction space. But you can't always make it smaller. There's some minimal size of obstruction space, which is this intrinsic obstruction space, which you have to have on any moduli space, which is a reflection of its singularities on any space. And so that's the dual of this, um, that, of this uh, kernel here. What is your comment on the scalar differential, you say? Uh, I didn't follow that. Um, so if you look in Hartshorn at the exact, sequ exact sequence of Kähler differentials, there's, there's two of them, I don't remember which one. Um, one of them says there's a, there's a short exact sequence. It, there's nothing, it doesn't say anything about, the, it doesn't give you a zero here, but it starts here. It says ideal mod I, ideal squared goes to the Kähler differentials or cotangent bundle of A restricted to M, and then its co-kernel is the Kähler differentials or cotangent sheaf of M. Okay, so it's a three-term exact sequence. So this one goes to this one, goes to omega of M, goes to zero. Uh, 
OK, but this is just a repackaging of the exact sequence on the previous page in fancier language designed to intimidate you. Um, and <coughs> precisely, the definition of a perfect obstruction theory, although it can be described dually in, in terms on the previous page, but uh, it complicates base change and you have to do it. It's complicated to write down. Um, but Lee and Tian did it. This dual way is much slicker to write down, but it's a bit harder to follow. And it's due to Berend and Fantecchi. And the pr precise definition is from any space, <coughs> for, for me, all my spaces are going to be quasi projective or projective, so um, it simplifies their definition a tiny bit. It is a choice of two term complex of vector bundles up to quasi isomorphism with a map to the cotangent complex, which is an isomorphism on zeroth cohomology sheaves and a surjection on minus oneth cohomology sheaves. Okay? What that's basically saying is this, this virtual cotangent bundle here is zeroth cohomology is really the cotangent sheaf of M. Um, as it is in this diagram here. And it, in this subjection on H minus 1 says that the obstruction space associated to this complex here, or well really it's dual when you go E0 goes to E lower 1, the obstruction space there contains the, the intrinsic obstruction space, which, has, which any scheme is associated to any scheme. So it says that the obstruction, the intrinsic obstructions embed into the obstruction space given to you by this complex. Okay, so this is a, this is a tricky definition. Or, well, I mean, it's a very easy definition, but uh, it's tricky to unpack. But hopefully I've convinced you that my fantasy on the previous page gives you one of these. Okay, and there, there it is. And what I'm going to show on the next page is that one of these gives the infinitesimal version of my fantasy. So, um, so it really is, you <coughs> this is a very usable, easy definition. To understand it, you should just understand it as being the, the uh, linearization of the fantasy on the previous slide, uh, the linearization around M. Any questions? Yeah. Um, the, the, the map from E dot to Lm, does this have to be a morph, a morph really come from a morphism of chain complexes or? No. Can't yeah, it's really just a map in the drive category. Okay, so what's the relationship between perfect obstruction theory and this fantasy global Kuranishi model? Okay, so as I said, the global Kuranishi model will always give you a perfect obstruction theory. That's uh, the top of this slide here. Conversely, a perfect obstruction theory always gives you local, Zariski local Kuranishi charts with, to which, you know, are compatible with the perfect obstruction theory. So uh, let's see that. So you can see it as follows. Um, so uh, <coughs> Locally, any scheme is cut out of a smooth scheme. Okay, so you just locally pick generators for your local ring uh, with some ideal i. And now, answering your previous question, locally, any morphism in the drive category is, a, is genuinely a map of complexes. It can be made, it's homotopic to a genuine map of complexes because these locally free sheaves are just projective modules. Okay, locally, a locally free sheaf is a projective object in the category of modules, so you can always lift. Okay, so we, we have a genuine map of complexes from my, my E dot to this uh, representative of the uh, co truncated cotangent complex. And now, <coughs> I can extend my bundle that I'm uh, my E1 to a bundle locally over a, 
over A, because I'm just working locally, is risky locally. My bundle on M always extends to A locally. And then I can lift my map here. Uh, ah, I missed, I missed something out. I can assume that the map from E minus 1 to I mod I squared is a surjection, because I could just add trivial piece onto E minus 1 and the same trivial piece onto E0. Um, and it wouldn't change this complex up to quasi-isomorphism. So anyway, I can assume this diagonal maps a surjection without loss of generality. Uh, that's sort of defined on M. And now I can, again, because it's a projective module, because it's locally free and I'm only working locally, so because it's free, I can pick a lift to a map here. Um, and then again, by shrinking if necessary, I can assume this is a surjection because it's a surjection on M. And so what does that mean? I've found a bundle with a map to the ideal sheaf, uh, with a surjection to the ideal sheaf. You compose it and think of it as a, a, a map to O. That's just a surjection of E. Uh, sorry, that's just a section of E. And it's a section of E which cuts out M because it surjects onto this ideal sheaf. Okay, so the, the section is, is generating the ideal sheaf. It's, cut, it's giving you all the equations which cut out M. How do you extend the, the, uh, to the entire A? Uh, well, it's just, fri you know, I'm only working locally, so you may as well assume that E minus 1 is just a trivial bundle, because it is locally trivial. All right? So, and then this is compatible with the previous slide, you know. Now you can take this local fantasy description of your local piece of M, and you can produce a perfect obstruction theory from it, and it's the one you started with. All right, so Zariski locally, these two notions are the same. And then there's a, a weak categorical homotopy infinity category nonsense way of gluing these local Kuranishi structures. Uh, I mean, they glue extremely weakly. They don't really glue in any geometric sense. Um, over open sets to define something called a Kuranishi structure on, on M. And so you find these Kuranishi structures on M suitably defined are the same thing as perfect obstruction theories. So um, the upshot is that this, the, the model is a fantasy, but it exists risky locally. We've just seen that. And then you can patch them in some weak, if you, if you, if you, if you're sufficiently infinity homotopy enough, um, then you can imagine a world in which you can patch them. And if you don't like that, instead, it exists globally to first order about M. Uh, and that's what a perfect obstruction theory is. That it's just the derivative of that fantasy model. All right, so I, I don't know if I helped at all, but um, if you prefer That is what a perfect obstruction theory is. There's the definition. It's only, you know, one sentence. Um, but it's, to me, it was always a, an intimidating sentence, and this helped. Um, for you, it may not do. All right. So um, it turns out to be a very useful concept, moduli spaces which have this structure of a perfect obstruction theory. I, I always think of it as meaning that, roughly speaking, the moduli space is cut out in a smooth ambient space by a section of a vector bundle of the right kind of rank. We will come to the virtual dimension in a minute. Of course, you can always do that, right? You, any quasi-projective scheme is embeddable in projective space. And then you can always pick some vector bundle of huge rank, which has a section which, which cuts it out. Um, but when you do that, if you take an enormous rank vector bundle, you're essentially sending the virtual dimension negative. You're cutting out by too many equations. When you perturb, you'll get the empty set. We don't want that. OK, so now here's a, here's a case where um, there's a natural perfect obstruction theory. So this is moduli of sheaves on some uh, smooth projective x. 
And this is just a globalized version of the previous lecture. All these X1s and X2s that we discussed, deformations and obstructions, this is just a, the global version of it all done in a family over M. So suppose you've got a universal sheaf on X times M, so over any point of M, so it's flat over M, and then over any point of M, when you restrict, you get a sheaf over X, and that sheaf over X is the one corresponding to that point of M. Okay, it's a tautology, so it's impossible to describe at the board. <coughs> then uh, there's something called the Atiyah class, which I'm not going to go into. Um, of E, it tells you roughly how twisted up E is. It defines, so ignore these truncations here, they're just to confuse you. Um, what, what, what this says, the way you should read this uh, equation here, this arrow, it's better to take its derived dual. So that check there means derived dual. So R home to the structure sheaf. If you take the derived dual of this, what it says is it says you should take the, the, the tangent complex of M and it should map to the complex R home EE. -E. So that's just the complex which whose cohomologies are at the x1 and the x2 that we've been discussing. So this is just the map from the tangent space of M to x1 EE. -E. This is just a fancier way of, doing that, of writing that down in two ways. One, globalizing it, so not just doing it at a point. And in the second thing we're doing is we're, write, we're not taking cohomology, we're writing this thing down on complexes before you take cohomology. But when you take cohomology of this map, then, um, or, or at least the dual of this map, then on zeroth cohomology, you're getting that the tangent space of M at a point maps to X1. And you're seeing that the intrinsic obstruction space of M embeds in X2. Um, okay. And there's this truncation where we, we remove the complex we truncate the complex so it really only has x1 and x2. Okay, this is an obstruction theory for M, so that's a theorem. Uh, I haven't really told you what an obstruction theory for M is, but what it is is it's the same as the definition of perfect obstruction theory without the requirement that this, this complex here can be written as a two-term complex of vector bundles. Okay. So it is also a perfect obstruction theory. So this, this guy on the left can be written as a two-term complex of vector bundles <coughs> uh, whenever it can be written as a two-term complex of vector bundles. Very good. Ah. OK, so, so modulo this issue of whether this complex can be written as a two-term complex of vector bundles. This is a perfect obstruction theory. Okay, so when can it be written in this, in this way? When, uh, that, that occurs, for instance, if all the higher exts vanish. So when all, <coughs> in general, you're going to have x1s, x2s, x3s, x4s, and so on. If, if your big x is of low dimension, maybe you only have x1s and x2s. If you're on a curve, maybe you only have x1s. Um, and then things are better. But the case I'm interested in is Calabi our three folds, and in that case you get the vanishing of these higher exts uh, by say duality. So the higher, the, for instance, x3 is dual to homs, and we already saw that when E is stable, these homs vanish. Uh, at least the trace-free homs, sorry. The zero here means trace-free. So the homs from E to E are just multiples of the identity, so when we, when we take the trace-free ones, you get nothing. And similarly, x4 is dual to x minus 1, which vanishes when e is a sheaf, and so on. So when, it, when all these higher x vanish point-wise, then uh, you can prove by some kind of reverse of base change that this complex is really a two-term complex of vector bundles. Okay. So what we end up with is one of these perfect obstruction theories for moduli of sheaves on Calabi R3 folds. So you have your x1 and your x2 defining deformations and obstructions. You essentially have no x3s and no homs. Uh, so because you only have these two guys, 
they are the cohomology of a complex of vector bundles. Their, their, their difference in dimension is a constant. In fact, it's zero. This topological constant, this virtual dimension, is zero in the Calabi R threefold case because the x1 and the x2 are ser dual to each other. So they've always got the same dimension. And the fact that they always have the same dimension means that they can be resolved in this way that they are the cohomology of a two term complex of vector bundles. But you have to take a trace free form, right? Yeah. You, no, but it's still the case. You don't really. It's still the case that you can use the full x1 and the full x2. So I, I'm just trying to state things more simply. So this full x1 and full x2 still form, they still are the cohomology of a two-term complex of vector bundles. Even though it is true, x0 and x3 don't quite vanish, but they're, they're just, they're very constant, right? They're just, they're just the trivial line bundle. So that doesn't really affect the argument. I was just trying to simplify things. I don't want to get into the difference between axed and trace-free axed. But you, you can use this. That's fine. Each, each, uh, each one of a surface shield doesn't manage. I don't, yeah, you don't need that. I mean, you, you, you'll probably get invariants which vanish, but you can use these. Okay, so... Um, so that's the obstruction theory. If I've lost you, just think about that fantasy model. Just pretend it's true. Now what I want to get out of this <coughs> is I want to get the correct cycle um, for the moduli space. So at the moment, the moduli space, is, it's got virtual dimension zero, if I'm on, in the Calabi R threefold case. Um, but it's got actual dimension way bigger than that. So moduli of sheaves on Calabi R's, satisfy some kind of Murphy's law. They're as bad as you like, they're as singular as you like. Um, actually, that's not quite true because they're critical schemes. But um, they're <coughs> they look dreadful and they're of too high a dimension in general. So um, you don't want to work with their fundamental cycle to start integrating over or trying to define invariance. You want to find some virtual cy some cycle of the correct virtual dimension. And so let, let's go back to the fantasy. If we're in the fantasy case, then we could perturb the section so that it was transverse to the zero section. And then um, its zeros would now have the correct virtual dimension. So you would get a homology class of the correct virtual dimension in A. Unfortunately, not in M, because when you perturb, the zeros of S will move off M slightly. Okay, and, and it would, you know what this homology class would be. It would be the Poincaré dual of the Euler class of E. Now, we can do better because we're algebraic geometers. Um, so we can get the class actually to lie in M and to be a Chow class, so really an algebraic object, by using fulton mcpherson intersection theory. So we can localize the Euler class of E to the zeros of this section, even when it's not transverse. Um, and then it'll turn out that the, the procedure, which I'm about to remind you of the fulton mcpherson intersection theory, it, it won't actually require the full fantasy model to hold. It'll only require the, the, to, uh, that it holds locally, that you have these Kuranishi charts locally, which you do. And that'll be enough to do the fulton mcpherson intersection theory. So that's kind of Baron and Fatakis insight. So uh, let me explain that. So, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's a picture in the fantasy model or a local version of it. So A is this horizontal axis. The section of E is the, the graph of it is this red thing. E is the vertical fibers. And I'm interested in taking the zeros of S, so I'm interested in intersecting the graph of S with the zero section of E, so with A here. And then that's what the fat um, red blobs are. That's the moduli space. 
So the moduli space is the zeros of s, and I've drawn this one fatter than this one because this one's like a, you know, it's got some non-trivial scheme theoretic thickening. Now what Fulton and McPherson tell you to do is they say replace this graph by the graph of not s but t times s. So make the graph more and more vertical and take the limit as t goes to infinity and the graph becomes something called a cone so it becomes c star invariant on the, the c star action on the fibres of the vector bundle. And this is called the, co the normal cone of m inside a. Alright, so when, when um, let's say m is smooth, maybe of the incorrect dimension, but when m is smooth, then this cone is really a, a copy of the normal bundle of m inside a, but made vertical via using the derivative of the section, so embedding it in e using the section. All right, so this is this, this cone here is the limit of these graphs, but it can be described just purely algebraically in this way. As I say, it is just you should think of it as the normal bundle of m in a. In good cases, it's just the normal bundle of m in a, and it embeds in e um, using uh, the section s. And this has a huge advantage, replacing the graph by the cone has the huge advantage that now I have no data left away from M. Everything, all my data is now concentrated over M. So I don't need A anymore once I have the cone, which is good for us. Sorry? Oh yeah, that's not good. Okay, well you know who to blame. Uh, yeah, sorry, that, that should be r, uh, to the power of i and to the power of i plus 1. I'll correct it and send it for the, the notes on the web. <coughs> yeah, so this should be uh, the ideal to the i over the ideal to the i plus 1. Okay, so this cone is supported over m. And so the big insight of Behrend and Fateki is that even though my current Ishii charts don't really glue in any geometric sense, only in some categorical sense. Um, the fact that the global perfect obstruction theory glues, so the vector bundles E glue and so on, and the, tan the tangent bundle to A, that was E0, the fact that they glue is enough to show that the cone actually glues. All right? So is it, if this is your picture on an open set, when you pass to another open set, you can't glue these A's, but you can glue these cones and these E's from one open set to the next. And now what we're going to do is instead of intersecting the graph with the zero section, we're going to intersect this cone with the zero section. And that will be the virtual cycle. So the definition of the virtual cycle is that you intersect the cone with the zero section of E1. And uh, this intersection is called a Giesin map, and it's defined again by Fulton McPherson. It's in Fulton's book. Um, and what it is defined, one way of defining it is, is the inverse of the Tom isomorphism. So there's an algebraic version of the Tom isomorphism, which is if you go from left to right here, you take cycles on M and you pull them up to get non-compact sort of Borel-Moore cycles or Chow cycles on E, then that's an isomorphism. So all cycles in E can be written as the pullback of a cycle on M. So it's, it's rationally equivalent to some, some vertical cycle. Okay, and then the, the Giesin map is just the inverse of that. So it says take any cycle on E, like this cone, and write it as a vertical cycle, a pullback of a cycle on M, and that cycle on M is your intersection. Uh, so uh, how, how this rational equivalence comes is... Uh it's not so, so these, oh, I beg your pardon, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, these Chow groups are these algebraic versions of homology groups. They're defined via algebraic cycles up to rational equivalence. So instead of taking cycles up to co-boundary, oh, cycles up to boundaries, you take algebraic cycles up to rational equivalence. Okay, so um, 
just to get a feeling for what this map is, uh, I give you some examples of how you do computations in Fulton McPherson theory. So these are nice. I encourage you to do them if you've never you know, battled with Fulton's book. And I encourage you to read Fulton's book. It's a masterpiece. Um, so suppose you have a line bundle, for instance, with a meromorphic section. Then by taking the limit of these graphs, you can, uh, in two different ways, you can take the limit as the graph becomes vertical, or you can take the limit as the graph becomes horizontal. And because they're equal in Chow, because they're rationally equivalent, um, <coughs> you can show that this vertical cycle, the, line, the entire line bundles over the zeros of the section, is equal to this vertical cycle, the entire line bundles over the infinity of the section, up to the zero section, which is not vertical. So what that says is, in Chow, the way you make the zero section of L into a vertical cycle, the pullback of something in the base, is you write it as, you know, the pullback of the zeros of S minus the pullback of the infinity, um, the poles of S. Now, so therefore, when you invert that and you intersect with the zero section, what that says is that the intersection of the zero section with itself in a line bundle is given by the zeros of S minus the poles of S, okay, which I hope you're familiar with already. So that's just the Euler class of L. Another exercise is suppose you have a subbundle and you have a section of E which lies in the subbundle. So it can't possibly be transverse to the zero section of E, but it could be transverse to the zero section of E primed. Then what that will mean is that the cone is really E primed. But that's not vertical. It, it sounds vertical, you know. In English, that's vertical, and hopefully in French it's vertical, but in um, maths it's not vertical. It's not the pullback of some cycle on M, because it's not all of E, it's just E primed. And so you have to make that into the pullback of some cycle on M, and th that defines its Giesin map. And um, when you do that, what you find is that you get the Euler class of the bit of the bundle that you haven't used yet, so E over E primed. So the obstruction bundle. You get the Euler class of the obstruction bundle. So that's a great exercise to do. So that's the situation in um, virtual cycles where you have a smooth moduli space, but of the wrong dimension. So it's of too high a dimension. So what that means is your obstruction sheaf becomes a nice obstruction bundle. It's locally free over your moduli space. And you take its Euler class, and that gives you the virtual cycle. And the sort of the C infinity version of that would be that you would write E as a direct sum. You would split the extension. So you'd write it as E primed plus, what's the, plus the obstruction bundle. And your section would be of the form S comma zero. So you've not used this obstruction bundle. And now you would perturb it to some S comma S primed. And that would give you, once your S primed is now transverse to the zeros of this obstruction bundle, what that would give you is that the virtual set cycle is the zeros of this SS primed. Well, the zeros of S takes you to M. And now on top of that, you want to impose that S primed is zero. And so what you end up with is on M, you end up with the zeros of S primed, which is precisely the Euler class of the obstruction bundle. OK, but this Fulton McPherson intersection theory gives you a way to do that um, without these perturbations. OK. So uh, these virtual cycles are extremely hard to compute. It took many years before people worked out ways to compute these things. There's four main techniques. So one is very occasionally the fantasy model really holds globally. So um, an example of that is when you compute um, genus zero, gromov witten theory of the quintic. You can see it, the, the ambient space is the space of genus zero stable maps to projective space, P4. That turns out to be smooth. And then it turns out there's natural equations you can impose on that to cut it down to the stable maps which lie in the quintic. And that gives you a global Kuranishi chart. And you can compute. And that was one of the very first computations in enumerative geometry, in, in virtual enumerative geometry. But it's extremely rare. 
There's another fantasy model which I'm going to talk about in um, uh, two lectures time where you have something called virtual degeneracy loci and there again you can compute instead of by taking an Euler class by taking certain other churn classes. Um, so that's rather new I guess. The older there's um, Degeneration, standard in algebraic geometry, degenerate. The, these virtual cycles are, have a deformation invariance, a homotopy invariance. And so you can degenerate your situation to maybe an easier one. Or, um, so sometimes you degenerate to a union of pieces which um, are maybe toric or have, have some symmetry. It can be extremely difficult to work out how to put everything back together when you smooth again. But modulo that issue, on these toric pieces, the way you can compute is using torus localization. So this was um, worked out by Graeber and Pandurapanda, how to, how to compute by localization in a virtual setting. So when you have a symmetry group, you can exploit that to do computa computations. And then there's another type of localization called cosection localization, which again I'll briefly discuss in two lectures time. And in fact we're going to use three to define Waffle Witten invariants. We haven't got there yet. And then we're going to use two and four to help compute them. Okay. I, so I just end here by um, very quickly. Yeah, I probably yeah, I'll um <coughs> so I've, I've more or less said this anyway. Let's suppose X is a smooth projective Calabi R threefold. You'll see the relevance to Waffer Witten theory tomorrow. So, what that means is that the canonical bundle of X is trivial. And suppose you have a stable sheaf on X. Then, as I've mentioned before, the higher X groups vanish, modulo this trace issue. Um, the X2 is actually dual to X1. So, in particular, the virtual dimension is zero. And um, what that means is that the, the um, obstruction theory given by the X to V that we've been talking about, the deformation obstruction theory is actually perfect of virtual dimension zero. And so, if there are no strictly semi-stable sheaves, if all the sheaves are stable, uh, then the moduli space is projective and compact, and there's a virtual cycle of dimension zero, and uh, you just integrate one over it, or you take the length of that cycle, and that gives you an integer. If there are strictly semi-stable sheaves, there's a Joyce Song's generalized ET invariant, um, which we'll discuss a tiny bit later on, but that's much more complicated to define, it uses whole algebras and fancy technology, um, and that's a rational number, but it, it strictly generalizes this. So when, when, in the stable case, it reduces to this integer here. So that, that's what's called DT invariance. And I just briefly, for completeness, tell you the MNOP conjecture, which is that when you take rank one DT invariance, so when your sheaves are of rank one, then they're really, up to tensoring by a line bundle, they're ideal sheaves. And their ideal sheaves are curves and points in X. So what you're doing, the DT invariant here is essentially counting curves in X. But it's really counting one-dimensional subschemes. So it's thinking of the curves as being cut out by equations. There's another way to think of holomorphic curves, which is as instead of these unparametrized curves being cut out by equations, you can think of them as parametrized curves, the images of holomorphic maps. And that's the subject of gromov witten theory. And the MNOP conjecture is that the two sets of data are equivalent. So the, the rank 1 DT invariants are equal in a very, this is a very complicated binary relation here, to the gromov witten theory of X. So these integers are equivalent to these rational numbers. But in a very complicated way, which I won't go into. And Pandra, Panda and Pixton have now proved this conjecture for most Calabi R threefolds that can be degenerated or under various moves, covers, degeneration, and so on, um, you can end up, if you can eventually write them in terms of toric pieces, then they've proved it for you. So this is really a theorem. And then recently, Sahela 
Faze Batch and I um, have shown that the DT theory in higher rank is actually governed by the rank one theory. Okay, so the information of curve counting gives you the information of the whole DT theory. So uh, there's a paper on my web page. It's not. It'll be on the archive in a few weeks. Um, on uh, modulo a certain conjecture, which is proved for various Calabi R three folds, but not all of them. But in particular, for instance, for the quintic, it's proved. And so for the quintic, where we know Pandra Pan the MNLP conjecture and this bogomolov gizeka conjecture, um, it's proved that the gromov witten theory of the quintic determines via, you know, insane formulae that you can't possibly get a handle on uh, yet, um, it determines the, the DT theory. Okay, so it turns out DT theory is just governed by curves um, on your Calabi R threefold. And um, so I'll stop here, but next time um, we'll define waffer witten invariants. They're extremely close to DT invariants, but they're, they're defined for surfaces, not threefolds. But associated to every surface, there's a, a local threefold, a local Calabi R threefold. Um, and uh, that's the relationship. That's why I'm describing DT theory. The two subjects are very closely related, but we'll see that next time. Question, comment. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that, so about the Bogomolov Gieseger conjecture? Yes. Uh, we have like an idea of uh, some class of uh, varieties for each fold? Not me, I'm not really an expert on that. Um, there probably are experts here. Um, it, it's, n it's not been proved on many things. It was a huge breakthrough when Chun Yi Li proved it for the Quintic threefold recently. Um, but it's the thing that you need to be true, or it's the best route to producing Bridgeland stability conditions on Calabi R threefolds. And so, where it has been proved, which is on Calabi R threefolds, which are closely related to abelian surfaces and the quintic, and then a few other things like double covers of P3 and things like that. Um, in those cases, we now know that there exist Bridgeland stability conditions on those three folds. So that, that's where it comes from. So it's work of um, Bayer, Macri, Toda, Stellari in different papers. Uh, they make this conjecture. It's, it's definitely not always true, but morally it's true. It's true enough in most cases uh, for our purposes. Um, but yeah, it's something that's more or less, some version of it is expected to be true on any Calabi R threefold, but we're not there yet. Or, yeah, it's not my field, but yeah. And so then the last implication you wrote is uh, expected to be true for like most Calabi Yeah, I, I absolutely expect this to be true for all Calabi outs. Yeah, but, but it's, not, it's not proved yet. Yeah. No idea. Does it even make sense? I, I'm not even sure if, if high rank DT theory makes sense on a local club, yeah. Maybe you'd need a framing or something. Yeah, it's low, that's rank zero on the Calabi Owl. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Yeah, I'm not sure. You're setting me homework again. You two are going to be banned from these lectures, I think. <laughs> I get, uh, yeah, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. Can you replace the one by, by zero? Yes. Zero implies all the others? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, more or less. So, so long as you allow the uh, rank zero, so long as you allow, the, the important thing is the, um, the sheaves which are supported in dimension two. You need those. Um, if you take the ones supported in dimension one, then it wouldn't be true perversely. Um, so if you just think about curves, DT invariance on sheaves on, on curves, in your Calabi R threefold, that is not enough to recover the Gromov-Witten theory, incredibly. <laughs> um.
because you, you, that'll only recover the genus zero gromov witten theory, yeah. It's kind of a bit of a paradox. But if you use refined DT theory, where instead of um, these just numerical invariants, you get sort of vector spaces and graded vector spaces and homology groups and so on, then you can recover gromov witten theory. Yeah, yeah, that would take a bit of explanation. I, I probably shouldn't go into it. Yeah? Is there some reason we should morally expect that the rank one theory controls the higher rank, or we just observe it then? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's really as simple as saying that all rank R bundles or sheaves can be written as iterated extensions of rank one sheaves, and you're sort of c controlling what the contributions of those extensions are and checking that they're kind of essentially given by universal formulae and churn classes and so on. Th that, that's some kind of dumb way of describing the wall crossing formula that we use. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it, yeah. It's just their extensions and rank one sheaves. It's, uh, you know, maybe you should think of it as a bit like cyborg witten theory governing Donaldson theory. cyborg witten theory is a rank one abelian theory. Donaldson theory is a higher rank non-abelian theory, and one governs the other. But this wasn't predicted by physicists, so I don't know, I don't know if there's an argument like their argument that Donaldson theory is governed by cyborg witten theory. So you have a lunch to go to, right? I, I feel like I'm delaying you. Is that right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so on the moduli space, you have this uh, abstraction theory. So you have this E zero and E minus one, and also you have push forward of the universal shoe. So is there some kind of interaction between the three? So some maps, some. The, uh, the push forward of the universal sheaf down to the moduli space. Was that the question? Yeah. So yeah, over a point you're taking the, the, the sections of the universe of, of the sheaf rather than the X groups from the sheaf to itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would consider that more to be that, that object, the push down of the chief. I would consider that to be more like an insertion. You would maybe take its churn character or something and integrate against moduli space. Or, um, it, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It's relevant. Uh, it comes in in, very, in some places, but uh, yeah, I don't have anything intelligent to say. Sorry. Okay, thank you.